Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, we have a very distinct panel of speakers, and uh, I won't take too long to um, introduce this roundtable. It is a part of a cycle of uh, roundtables that we are organizing at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra. I would like to um, thank the uh, the center, SESH, for uh, allowing us to to go forward with this project and also all the, the speakers for today's panel uh, for joining us and giving us the opportunity to discuss this uh, urgent matter, uh, especially because today we know that uh, the International Court of Justice is uh, starting to hear the case um, presented by South Africa uh, uh, against Israel for genocide. So this is a very timely discussion, and uh, we are lucky to have the opportunity to, to hear from um, these, uh, these guests that I'm going to present right now. Um, the first speaker will be Ambassador Nabil Abuzneid, the head of the diplomatic mission of Palestine to Portugal. Uh, we also have Shahd Hamouri, who is a lecturer uh, in law in the, at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. Hanin Kinani, the International Advocacy Officer uh, at the, the Palestine Institute for Public Dip Diplomacy, and Manuel Lov, uh, Associate Professor at the Department of History and Political International Studies uh, at the University of Porto, Portugal. Thank you all very much for joining us. And uh, without further ado, I will give the floor to Ambassador uh, Nabila Busneid. Uh, please go ahead, Ambassador. Good evening. And uh, really, it's my pleasure to be with you this evening and to be with students from Quimbra to talk about a subject and a problem for more than 100 years, we can't have a solution. Uh, the idea of Zionism was created in Europe. The idea was to create a Jewish homeland for Jews in Europe in some areas, it was discussed Argentina, Uganda, Palestine, and there were missionaries visited these countries. The mission, missionary visited Palestine, came back with one sentence, that the bride is so beautiful, but is married to someone else. This is their findings about Palestine, that Palestine is so beautiful, but it has its own people who are living there. So how can then you can manage to create a state from an idea was born in Europe in a place in the Middle East where the owners of this country are there. So they need political support, which they got from the British, they got also the support from United States who supported the British at that time. And when Palestine became under the British mandate, they used it to bring more settlers to Palestine. In the early time, Jews were 6% in Palestine and they ended in 1948 to be about 45%. So the idea of Zionism cannot succeed without forcing the Palestinians from their lands and their homes. And Palestinians will not leave easily. So Zionism and the uh, Haganah and the military organizations in the Zionist movement used force against the Palestinians. And all of us, we heard about the Yassin massacre, where about two, 300 people were massacred in their own village. This was to scare Palestinians and move them out of their land. Also about 500 villages and towns were demolished and were really taken, uh, destroyed, and they tried to move all uh, signs of Palestinians in Palestine to look, make it look an Israeli new state. 
So the creation of the state of Israel in 1948 forced 850,000 refugees to be out of their lands and their homes. So this is what you are uh, these days hear the question about the Palestinian refugees. These are the people who were forced to leave their land in Palestine and many of them in Gaza now. And the one you see the Israelis trying to move them again, they were the Palestinian people who were forced in 1948 to live in refugee camps in Gaza. Palestinians never uh, lost hope to go back to their homeland. And the United Nations had some resolutions which two states should be in Palestine, a Palestinian state and a Jewish state. And also there was a decision, a UN resolution to give the Palestinians the right to go back to their lands, the refugees, and to be comp compensated, and this is number 194. Palestinians never lost hope in going back to their lands. Zionism and imperialism thought the Palestinians will forget because the olders will die and the youngers will forget. That was not the case. Palestinians still today are still holding the keys to go back to their homes and their lands. In 1967, the Israeli army occupied the rest of Palestine, which was the West Bank and Gaza Strip. So and after the war of 1948, Gaza became under the Egyptian rule and the West Bank came under Jordanian rule. With the hope to go back, the Palestinian created the organization which called PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, to lead their struggle to go back to their homeland. In 1967, the Palestinians also did not accept the defeat of the Arab armies and they believed in resistance. So after the war of 67, with the creation of the PLO and Fatah as one of the militant Palestinian, Palestinian faction, which was created in 19, 1965, started rebuilding the idea of the resistance to go back and to liberate Palestine. The Israeli army in the West Bank thought really to control it, but they felt Moshe Dayan was the defense minister at that time. We cannot control this area without building settlements. Settlements would legalize and legitimize, legitimize our existence in the West Bank. He said, Dayan, without settlements, people will look at us as an occupying army. But when we have settlements, they see us as a protecting our own people. The same time they thought of these settlements really to be a security camps, in the same time, agriculture, and also uh, to be used for factories and so on. So this was the idea of building settlements and also taken this land from the Palestinians uh, because the tie is important between Palestinians and their lands. So the struggle continues, uh, continued and in 1987, we have a big mass revolt where people went to the streets demanding their freedom, which we call the Intifada. Intifada was in 1987 uh, and started in Jabalia refugee camp, which we see now the war and the killing and the destruction is taking place in Gaza, in Jabalia as well. After the Intifada, the Israelis felt 
and the international community as well, there must be a solution to the Palestinian problem because the occupation cannot continue. At that time, Rabin, Ishaq Rabin was the defense minister in the government, in a right-wing government with the Likud. He felt that it's impossible to continue the occupation without addressing the Palestinian question. So when he won the elections in 1992, in June 1992, he started thinking of contacting the PLO to find a deal between Palestinians and the Israelis, and that led to Oslo Agreement. Oslo Agreement was uh, signed at the White House loan in 1993, where uh, Israelis and Palestinians agreed to negotiate serious issues like settlements, borders, Jerusalem, the, the next three years or so, maximum five years to find a solution. And prior to the Oslo, three days before the signing, Israel recognized the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people and Israel, uh, the PLO recognized Israel. Some months after signing the Oslo agreement, a settler from Kiryat Arba, Goldstein, Baruch Goldstein, went to a mosque in Hebron while people were praying, killed 30 of them and around 100 were injured. Why did he do that? I think to destroy the peace process, which is Oslo. When it happened during Ramadan and while people were praying in the mosque, Arafat and Rabin managed to save the peace process and they brought international observers to the occupied territories. And when the right-wing settlers saw that Rabin and Arafat managed to keep the peace process, they decided to kill Rabin. Rabin was killed by an Israeli settler uh, called Igal Amir. By killing Rabin, Arafat said they did not kill the peace process. They, kill, they did not kill Rabin, but they killed the peace process as well. So Israel believed in superiority in their military and their, in their behavior toward even all people in the Middle East. Israel really ignored all international uh, resolutions, also behaved in a different manner in violation of international law in the occupied territories. They violated every law you can imagine, moving people from their homes, destroying people's farms, taking their land, putting them in jail, collective punishment. You can imagine that. As if the world has two laws, one applies to Israel and one applies to international community. So Israelis never believed in obeying any laws and they believed in superiority and they believed in occupation is the only way to survive and also land confiscation because without land confiscation, Zionism will not be affected. So on October 7, some Palestinians crossed the borders at Gaza. And that shows all military in the world will not protect Israel. What protect Israelis? Peace with the Palestinians. And unfortunately, they don't see it this way. And you see the reaction now in Gaza. Gaza 70% destroyed, 100,000 civilians between killed, injured, or under rebels now. And the Israelis trying or talking to transfer some of the Palestinians out. And the same people who believe the idea of to build the state in Israel, while it has its own people 
Palestinians, Smotrich saying, oh, Gaza looks beautiful. We should take it again and build settlements on it. So finally, why we cannot find solution to this problem? All conflicts are created by human beings and they should end by human beings. But why the Palestinian question? I think one idea, people think that United States holds the solution for the Middle East or the Palestinian problem, that they have the keys. America since 1944, see the Palestinian question or the conflict is a domestic question used in the American elections and in the agenda for running to presidency elections in America. So it's a domestic question and they will never pressure Israel and also Europe like Germany, who sub, I mean England and Germany. For example, England supported the idea by full Balfour Declaration to give Palestine to Israel. Germany, for the feeling of guilt toward what the Nazis had done to the Jews, they can say no to Israel. They let Israel do what they want. So United States failing to pressure Israel and also Europe not doing anything, thinking that America holds the keys. International community, all the resolution, about 100, uh, about 1,000 resolutions did not uh, affect Israel or they did not implement one of them. Palestinians, if they go to international organization like ICC or so, are not allowed in the views of the Americans and the Israelis, even some uh, organizations like the health organizations. If the Palestinians join, there is no money. Americans will cut the aid to these organizations. And if African sick boy needs medicine, they'd say, well, sorry, we have no money. We have problem. Why is the problem? Because the Palestinians. So we are not allowed to join international organization. And if we do, do, we pay the price and you know what happened in the UNESCO. So what choices do we have? We have now ideas of solutions. One solution, uh, one state solution that all people live in Palestine, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all kinds of people, different religions or color, they can live under one uh, law, equal rights. We agree to that, but Israel says no. If they don't want the one state solution, we suggest the two state solution, a two state solution, Israel, which exists now, and Palestine will have state in West Bank, Gaza, with East Jerusalem, its capital. And that constitutes only 22% of the historical Palestine. Israel rejects that as well. Israel is interested in the status quo now to continue the occupation. And in history, occupation has no long life. And I am sure it is going to end very soon. So this is in a brief, I don't want to take any more uh, uh, of time because it's also difficult to explain all the situation within 10, 15 minutes, but I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Very important uh, um, introduction for us to grasp a little bit of the historical um, process um, that we are seeing unfolding. So uh, if, you, if you can, please, uh, Shat, can you take the floor? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, you can hear me well? Just uh, thumbs up? Okay, perfect. Uh, so first of all, thank you for having me here today uh, at this historic day for the Palestinian people. Uh, this morning we had uh, one of the most amazing um, uh, scenes you could imagine in the history of international law, where the Kufiyas stood uh, side by side the South African flag. Uh, it's a sign of uh, global South solidarity that speaks uh, to a historical spirit that we have hoped to see in the Palestinian discourse for 75 years now. 
Uh, this morning, uh, South Africa presented the arguments against Israel for the case of genocide. Next uh, month, we will also be hearing states present arguments against the uh, illegality of the Israeli occupation as a whole in the advisory opinion uh, on the legal uh, consequences of the illegality of Israeli occupation. So we can say that we are witnessing a moment, a, a, a historical moment where the narrative is switching. Uh, as kindly noted by Ambassador Nabil, uh, what we have seen in the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a state of exceptionalism for Israel, where Israel is always seen as an uh, uh, as outside of the international legal order. Uh, from a perspective of international law, Israel is the number one perpetrator since the start of uh, the uh, United Nations. And, and the first resolutions were then about its violations and the amount of resolutions that are in the United Nations about the violations of Israel of international law are unsurmountable unsurmountable. Um, and the fact that uh, the world suffers this amnesia of forgetting over and over again the ethnic cleansing of Palestinians prior genocide, and also the fact that the world seems to uh, very quickly forget that this is not just a context of occupation. And Israel even denies that it's a context of occupation, despite, of course, the uh, uh, agreement on that in mainstream legal academia. Uh, this is also a context of apartheid and a context of settler colonization. If this is not settler colonization, I don't know what is. And as I always say, the case of Palestine is pretty particular because it was colonized at the moment when the rest of the world was being decolonized. And again, this brings us back to the case because it's very interesting to see that South Africa that has a very long history with settler colonization and um, systematic racial uh, segregation uh, is able to kind of convey the experience of its lawyers by uh, taking this uh, case uh, to the court. So Palestinians for the longest time ever were even denied to call things by their name, and that is settler colonization. And from a legal perspective, the case of Palestine is pretty clear cut, uh, as has been argued by the state of Palestine in the other parallel case, the uh, ongoing uh, uh, occupation of uh, Palestine is in contravention to the Palestinian people's right of self-determination, the prohibition against annexation, and the prohibition against apartheid, three of which are preemptory norms of international law. That means they're principal norms, there's no way of getting out of them, and they're held at the highest level possible. Today, of course, we saw other allegations towards Israel, which said that it also uh, breached one of the uh, one of the also most sacred uh, rights in uh, uh, rights protected international, which is the right against uh, uh, for protection against genocide. So here we see an accumulation of violations uh, where uh, the uh, political and imperial uh, um, let's say, tendencies in international law are being broken. So I'll go back to the topic uh, of today, which is on the geopolitics, imperialism, and normalization of relations, and kind of link that back to the ongoing case. So uh, uh, there is, uh, from a scholarly perspective, uh, politics exists at a different dimension from the law, supposedly. And the difference between me and a politician is that I would have had a training in what is the meaning of justice. And my whole job was to try to convey or uh, understand how justice on an international legal, uh, on an international framework looks like. Of course, law and, law and international politics are very, very uh, uh, closely interrelated. And what states like Israel try to do is to actually push the reading of international law, uh, which uh, is, uh, allows the more heavy politics in the making of international law to be much more out there on the stage, let's say. Uh, so... But from a legal perspective, as I, as I noted from the start, the case of Palestine is very clear cut. It's a case of people who fall under alien domination and subjugation, which is completely illegal from its start. And the Palestinian people also have the right of return to areas that are currently, uh, un uh, that are currently demarked as territories of Israel. The right of return for the Palestinian people is an inalienable right that actually is recognized in the UN resolution, which recognized the 
state of Israel itself, that uh, Israel has to recognize that all people who were thrown out of Palestine in 1948 uh, in, uh, during Al Nakba have the right to go back. This right is that of its descendants. And we need to remember that 80% of the population of Gaza uh, are people who are legally classified as refugees, we mean uh, here in the descendants of people who were displaced in Al Nakba and have an undisputable right of return to areas now recognized as Israel. And I have to stress that recognizing the right of return does not uh, uh, infringe upon the rights of Israelis. Uh, the one right does not mean uh, that another right uh, is uh, uh, is uh, looked uh, uh, is looked down upon, but actually what we are proposing here is equal rights for everyone and the historical recognition of the rights of everyone. Uh, so, uh, so what happens in this case is that because of this exceptionalism that is created for Israel, uh, for Israel, and because of this normalization of a settler colonial uh, action and system and process that is always ongoing, we have a tension in the area, and this tension has been exploited by imperial powers for the longest time ever. Of course, this tension is sustained by imperial powers, by the ingra uh, by ingraining an imperial reading in international law, in the international legal system, but also uh, it is being used by imperial powers as a tool to facilitate tension uh, and economic and political interest in the area. To be clear, when I say imperial powers, I also, not only do I mean the US, but I also mean Iran and Russia. At the end of the day, from a perspective of the global South, uh, these are bigger powers with hopes of controlling and intervening in other states. Uh, this is a political struggle, not a struggle for and uh, not in relation to uh, uh, to that of justice. And uh, we have seen a very important switch in politics in the past few years, where we go from a unipolar world uh, where, uh, let's say, the US and the EU are uh, in, uh, in control of a complete hegemony in the world into back to a multipolar world where imperial powers are more in uh, fighting with each other on one level and historically speaking when imperial powers are fighting with each other on one level that leaves some open room of space of breathing as we saw in the 1960s and 70s for states of the global south to try to switch the narrative for themselves so the switch in international politics could be the historical moment when the narrative of the Palestinian people was switched what Israel is trying to do is to use the already existing tension to facilitate further uh, uh, further uh, conflict in the area and uh, in, in terms of international law Israel's act are inherently in contravention to international peace and security as we saw what Israel did in Gaza led to a violence also erupting in Yemen in Lebanon and in other areas uh, in other areas in the region this is really dangerous and instead of the Security Council going in to condemn uh, uh, Yemen, uh, the actual uh, real way to solve that tension is very simple, and that is by solving the existing uh, the existing problem by giving the Palestinian people their legal rights, and that way no no imperial powers would be able to exploit this ongoing uh, tension. As for the normalization of relations, um, uh, akin to the Oslo process, normalizing relations with Israel or even uh, uh, debating with Israel any sort of giving up uh, the uh, inalienable rights of the Palestinian people is uh, is legally uh, in contravention uh, to uh, in contravention to state uh, to state obligations and in contravention to uh, the Palestinian people's right uh, uh, rights. So with, as we saw with the Oslo process and now as uh, debated uh, specifically in relation to the parallel case at the International Court of Justice, uh, Oslo is completely seen as uh, a non-functional document and actually in its start is actually seen as an invalid legal document. Uh, some arguments would tell you that Oslo was created through duress, uh, which I would highly agree with, but then Oslo included negotiating inalienable rights of the Palestinian people. Uh, whatever happens at no point does any power have the right to give up a part of its people, uh, people's territory or a part, a part of its people's sovereignty over natural resources or the right of self-determination. 
Constitution. These rights are not open for debate. They shouldn't have been open for debate in the 1980s, nor should they be open for debate now. What Israel and the US always have tried to push the Palestinian people to do is to negotiate on political principles, using the language of politics, striving away from the language of justice and the language of logic, so to speak, uh, where mm, we have very inalienable direct uh, rights for the Palestinian people. Meanwhile, and, and this now follows with the, uh, with the series of normalizing relations we saw in the 90s and the bigger normalizing that is happening now. So let, let's be clear. All states under international law have the duty of non-recognition towards grave violations of international law. They also have a duty of non-cooperation with grave violations of international law. The Israeli occupation as a whole is a grave violation of international law that is in contravention to international peace and security. That is a very clear uh, cut uh, conclusion. Uh, if we read international law with an eye to the jurisprudence of the global south and with an eye towards a reading of international law that is steeped in the concept of justice rather just, than just a positivist reading that tries to also be uh, very much focused on uh, the, uh, the role of politics in international lawmaking. Uh, so and to normalize relations with those with Israel is actually that means uh, that means normalizing uh, the illegal. Okay, I will uh, re reach uh, my ending points. Uh, that means normalizing uh, normalizing the illegal. And if anything, we see now with the ongoing genocide in Gaza, which is that these positions of normalization have actually facilitated that, which also makes Arab states complicit in the ongoing genocide. All states have the duty to prevent genocide and take all measures viable to prevent genocide, including economic and political boycott. By not taking these measures, uh, Arab states are inherently in violation of their direct international uh, rights and to see that being taken forward in the name of politics and in the name of uh, economic uh, relations means that we are stepping away from a world where logic and justice uh, have any sound to a world of complete uh, politics which is why at this moment we need to go back to a language that is very strongly steeped in the ideals of justice because uh, it's very clear-cut when we uh, perceive the issues from that perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Had. Uh, now I give the floor to Hanin, please. Thank you again um, for having me today and for this opportunity. I also want to uh, echo the words of Shah that this is indeed um, a historical uh, day and definitely and hopefully a, st a step towards true accountability and genuine justice for the Palestinian people. Um, and uh, yeah, um, so yeah, thanks again for having me. Um, my name is Hanin and I'm the advocacy officer for the Palestine Institute for Public Diplomacy. Uh, and we are a Palestine-based organization uh, focusing on shifting the discourse and policy on Palestine through um, international mobilizations uh, and campaigns. And uh, today I wanted to focus, given the title that we're discussing, I wanted to focus on the aspect of uh, normalization and what it means in the context of Palestine and how it has helped perpetuate the harmful reality of oppression for the Palestinian people, including how it is interconnected to the Arab population in the region as well. And so I would start by saying, that first normalization doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, it happens in a historical context and condition um, of its own. Uh, and to give a bit of context to the dynamics that existed, um, the relationship between the Palestinian people and the Arab countries and the population uh, was a normal one uh, to the region, um, where there's a shared uh, culture, history, languages, and at some point even also under shared imperial Western powers. Um, and uh, Arab solidarity has actually uh, existed, uh, or Arab solidarity with the Palestinian people has existed much longer than uh, the 1948 Nakba, it included also in the 1936 Arab revolt against the British mandate uh, forces, which was led uh, by the Palestinians and Arabs, um, as well as in 1948 war known as the Nakba, where we saw volunteers from uh, the region who joined the Arab Liberation Army in defense of Palestine. 
uh, at that time. So following that period, um, there has been obviously uh, at the regional level, a rejection of Israel's colonial project in the region um, and the consequences it has brought. Um, however, over a period of time, and gradually due to Israel's exertion of its power in the region backed by powerful allies, um, and particularly over, even though it, it was a longer period of time, there has been a gradual shift towards the attitudes and approaches to normalization uh, in the region. So the term normalization has emerged um, following Israel's and Egypt peace treaty or peace agreement in 1979. And uh, following that, we have seen basically the term or the uh, the efforts of uh, what became became to be known as the anti-normalization efforts by Palestinians and Arabs who began to use this term to describe the refusal to deal and engage uh, with the Israeli regime as a normal entity um, in the region that have expelled uh, and killed indigenous Palestinians in order to establish a colonial project in Palestine. So um, one of the main turning points uh, for uh, these Arab countries or the approaches to normalization has been uh, the Oslo Accords of the 1990s, which among many things, it has brought the framework of the two-state solution, uh, the peace building project uh, when main uh, features of a state were absent, uh, and without uh, uh, the root causes of the injustice that were taking place. Um, and following that period for the Palestinians, we have witnessed the solidification of the uh, apartheid regime, the entrenching of the colonization and occupation of Palestine. We have seen more fragmentation across historic Palestine, oppression and dispossession. Um, and one thing that this period has signaled for the Arab region and for the authoritarian regimes uh, more particularly is that it is not necessarily taboo to do so anymore, to not normalize uh, with the with the regime. Um, and even though the period after that um, for like authoritarian regimes, it took much longer time to formally and publicly normalize uh, with the Israeli regime, uh, relations and cooperations around security and intelligence were very much active and rife during that period. And uh, there has been also concerns over the uh, possibility of domestic uh, unrest, which was a driving factor in that period, particularly because of the uh, Arab Spring in 2011, uh, which uh, across North Africa and the Arab world where we've seen um, uh, Arab citizens mobilizing and demanding uh, democratic reforms um, uh, across the streets in the Arab world. Uh, and also the fact that um, the, U the US president then Barack Obama has showed a shallow support to these uh, 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 to the uprising, but it mostly worried the authoritarian regimes because they also felt, felt that they need uh, to, um, they felt the pressure to uh, uh, to form, uh, to do the, like reforms uh, internally. Um, so the shift towards normalization uh, has mostly uh, epitomized like more publicly during the uh, 2020 Abraham Accords. Uh, which was backed by the former um, U.S. President Donald Trump, uh, which has brought peace agreements uh, between Israel, uh, the United Arab Emirates, um, and Bahrain, and later also with uh, Morocco and Sudan. And these peace agreements were um, claimed to bring uh, peace and stability to the region uh, and were hailed as a historic moment, despite the fact that these countries were not actually at war with the Israeli regime. Um, however, the instrumentalization of the accords were, were for specific geopolitical and economic interest to further subject the MENA region and its people to uh, resources, uh, exploitation, uh, and degradation. Um, so it essentially brought together authoritarian regimes to sign weapons deals and further intelligence sharing and share it and call it a, 
um, a peace agreement. So for the UAE, it was um, they uh, they received the twenty three billion arms deal, twenty three billion dollars arms deal, uh, including drones uh, uh, and other ammunitions that were also tested on Palestinians and sold internationally. For Bahrain, uh, they had established um, the Bahraini-Israeli ties have resulted basically in the U.S. whitewashing their concern over Bahrain's domestic human rights violations. Uh, for Sudan, uh, it resulted in the Trump administration delisting the country from the terrorist list uh, and, and, and removing the sanctions that were imposed on the country. Uh, and for Morocco, even more ironically, the, the Trump administration, as a re result of the accords, they have uh, recognized the occupied Western Sahara as a sovereignty, um, as a Moroccan sovereignty or uh, as controlled by Morocco. So under the guise of these peace um, agreements, the Abraham Accords has actually sought materially to reinforce military and uh, security cooperation and deepen the private sector's leverage through arms and surveillance industries and establish a much stronger uh, platform uh, for business deals and uh, uh, between authoritarian and repressive and colonial regimes. Um, and particularly the military aspect we have seen is that the Israeli military weapons that were used and tested uh, on the occupied Palestinian peoples for decades have been used as a, a token and then exported internationally, including to the Arab world. And other than the um, uh, material aspect of these uh, uh, peace agreements or accords, uh, there has been also um, the, the re authoritarian regimes in the region had to instill a narrative and the level of control uh, on its population to prevent any backlash or and had it had increased the repression so it ensured that there is no um, opposition to these agreements internally so for example uh, the state's policy in the UAE they went to the extent to send whatsapp messages to silence opposition voices uh, in the country uh, and in Bahrain too they had passed the policy criminalizing oppo opposition voices to the peace agreements um, but more so these agreements intended to align the authoritarian regime's position with the U.S. and Israel's policy and aspirations in the region. So uh, by claiming that uh, these regimes, with, with the normalizing with Israel, they are trying to show a much progressive and tolerant image uh, uh, to the other, which is basically this touches upon how the Abraham Accords um, are framed as a, a peace uh, to a religious war that gives it a religious connotation that it was an ancient uh, struggle in the region between Muslims and Jews. Um, and in this way, basically saying those that are against these uh, Abraham Accords are intolerant and violent and aligning them with the Palestinian people who are rejectionists uh, uh, and violent, etc. So... Um, uh, these peace agreements, more than anything, the objective was uh, that it uh, bypassed the Palestinian struggle for freedom and it intended to marginalize the Palestinian people in their struggle for justice. Uh, it was basically um, an agreement uh, designed to impose yet another false peace deal on the Palestinians in an attempt to exchange their, uh, their inalienable political rights with economic inducements, so basically bettering the conditions of the Palestinian people, but all in all under Israel's infinite control, um, uh, and entrenching further the colonization, which was mostly administered and continues to be administered through disposition, ethnic cleansing, uh, annexation, and genocide as well. Um, and also undermining uh, the Palestinian people's internationally recognized uh, right of return and the right to self-determination. Uh, uh, um, so, um, well, this is at the level of the geopolitics of the regimes in the regions. Obviously, um, the bubble has bursted, uh, particularly with the unfolding genocide, uh, because the objective of these so-called peace agreements was to control the public opinion, over its support to the Palestinian people and the Palestinian struggle for freedom, uh, which proved ineffective 
because the public opinion uh, in the Arab streets were in complete contradiction uh, and opposition to the regimes, uh, even though symbolically, for example, in, we can see a shift in the tone of these regimes from the beginning of the war until now, even though it has been very costly uh, for the Palestinians. Um, but I'm finishing this. Yes. Um, most Arab citizens are um, in the region are very much beaten by their own uh, autocratic systems and by the severe economic stress. So the Palestinian struggle for freedom has always been seen um, as the shared anti-colonial struggle against oppressive systems in the region um, because of how uh, these oppressive systems are very interconnected uh, and uh, uh, um, materially, but also discursively. So I will finish for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hanin. Uh, I will give the floor to Professor Manuel Love now, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I thank uh, Professor uh, Teresa Cravo and Moara uh, Crivilent uh, for having uh, invited me to to be part of this um, of this panel. I'm truly honoured. And um, I'm an historian, and so what is um, what I'm what I surely was expected to present to you is a um, a quick, <clears throat> brief historical analysis interpretation of at least uh, the, um, this last century, or um, um, sorry, at, at least this last uh, seventy five years since nineteen forty eight and the Nakba the catastrophe imposed on the Palestinians. Let me remind you, and already Ambassador uh, um, Nabil Abu Znaid has, has mentioned it, that Zionism was, was born both as a nationalist uh, as well as a colonial project of the European Jewish um, uh, Jews to build up uh, a state in, in, in Palestine. It fully depended, it is, it fully depended in the past and still today on European, uh, on the European powers in the past colonial projects for the Middle East, but now obviously on the Western powers um, attitude towards and, 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 and strategy towards the area. Uh, we all know that the World War II paved the way uh, for the final crisis of European colonialism everywhere in the world and also in uh, the Middle East. But it wouldn't be neither easy nor quick uh, to uh, see the Fra both the French and the British to rush out of uh, their Middle East um, uh, colonies, at least, well, formally speaking, from, uh, from an international right point of view, it was uh, they had uh, League of Nations uh, mandates over uh, these areas. The French over Syria and Lebanon, and the British uh, over um, several territories, Iraq, uh, what in the future would be Saudi Arabia, what the British called Transjordan and Palestine, together with the protectorate imposed on Egypt. I won't be um, bothering you with uh, too much, uh, too many historical details on that, but anyway. Uh, the French, uh, true, uh, rushed out of Syria and Lebanon, but very soon because of the Algerian war uh, starting in 1954, uh, they committed many of its forces to punish every form of Arab solidarity with that specifically Nasser from Egypt uh, would try to articulate and um, try to articulate. And in the case of uh, the Suez operation, uh, in 1956, 57, um, it started, France started together with the UK, a war against Egypt, already in collusion with the state of Israel, um, becoming at that point, obviously one of the major, the major uh, Western ally in the end. The, for the British, things were more complicated because of the fact that the British had since 1920, a mandate, a League of Nations mandate to rule over Palestine. And they associated it, obviously, with the Zionist project from the very beginning. Uh, they, nevertheless, at the end of the war, World War II, after 1945, they had to face Jewish armed campaign against the, the mandate, in spite of having the British authorized uh, against previous commitments uh, they had with commitment they had with the Arab representatives. They authorized over 100,000 new Jewish immigrants um, to add up to the, all those that throughout the 1920s and 30s had already migrated to Palestine as settlers. 
1947, we also all know, but it's my role to remind you that the, um, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine uh, passed a partition plan on Palestine that clearly failed. Uh, it established that uh, there would be two different Jewish and Arab states, though economically united, and there would be a special and separated status for the city of Jerusalem, uh, becoming an internationally uh, international uh, city uh, or territory. It um, the Jewish agency understood that it was clearly st strategic for the Jewish uh, leaders, Zionist leaders, to approve the uh, the plan of uh, of partition that was clear the partition plan that was clearly favorable to the Jewish uh, uh, interests but the Arab High uh, Committee representing the Palestinian po population called for a general uh, strike and the Arab states uh, clearly uh, not only voted but moved against the plan from the very beginning the Jewish leaders and Ben Gurion, the first of them, the first pri um, Israeli prime minister, and from 1948 to 1963, at that time, 1947, chairman of the executive committee of the Jewish Agency, uh, clearly stated, very well, it is public, publicly stated, stated, and it's absolutely uh, well known by uh, by everyone uh, from 1947 that. For the Jews, uh, uh, this what was the fact the fact that over forty percent of the population within the borders designed by the United Nations Special Committee uh, Committee to be the future state of Israel within those borders over forty percent of the population were uh, was Palestinian, and and now I'm quoting Ben Gurion this demographic he called it he calls it like that fact must be viewed in, in all its clarity and acuteness. With such a population composition, there cannot even be an, absolutely, an absolute certainty that control will remain in the hands of the Jewish majority, Ben Gurion says. There can be no stable and strong Jewish state so long as it has a Jewish majority of only 60%. And in fact, and now, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> end of quote, this became a permanent obsession of the, for the Jewish leaders and the state of Israel. And mind you, this is a typical uh, racist and supremacist attitude that you will find in any of the extreme right and racist uh, organizations and movements, um, attitudes and statements, uh, for instance, uh, talking about uh, when talking about the Euro European or uh, North American uh, societies. Uh, is, it is at that point, the end of 1947, and all throughout 1948 and 49, that the catastrophe, the Nakba, starts, uh, is imposed on the Palestinian populations. Uh, as several, uh, even Israeli uh, historians such as um, Ilan Pape uh, have abundantly uh, documented, uh, there is a series of atrocities and obviously ethnic cleansing by the Jewish uh, military and authorities that, and I'm quoting, were part of a master plan to rid the future Jewish state of as many Palestinians as possible. Uh, in fact, until May 1948, the legal responsibility over these facts um, uh, should be accounted for the British. So the British were officially responsible for law, law and order during the early phases of the removal uh, of the indigenous population, that is, uh, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians. And because we're still in the last months of the mandate, at the end of the process, uh, out of about 850,000 Palestinians living in the territories designated uh, by the United Nations as a Jewish state, only 160,000 remained on or nearby their land and homes. And obviously, at the end, uh, so on the whole, 750,000 Palestinian are expelled from the Israeli territory designed by the partition plan. And I'm only mentioning the one designed by the partition plan. I'm not saying that it was a legitimate territory. Um, and until March 1949, another 350,000, or out of those 750, sorry, 350,000 were expelled after, uh, until, during the war, until March 1945, uh, from the Israeli newly occupied territories. That is, 
uh, other territory that it that was that were that were occupied was occupied by the Israeli troops uh, military during the war, the so-called War of Independence, as the Israeli uh, called uh, called to the 1948-49 war. It start 1948 starts a mm, new a second stage on the Ju Judaization of Palestine process. Um, and uh, and obviously, all since then, since uh, the uh, UN General Assembly Resolution 194, or also already mentioned in here, the state of Israel, of Israel uh, refuses to comply to uh, international, in this case, UN resolutions, uh, granting the Palestinian the right of return. In June 1967, so 18 years later, 19 years later, uh, sorry, Israel defeats a coalition of Arab nations in the Six Day War and from then on occupies East Jerusalem, Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. All of these territories are internationally recognized as occupied territories. And uh, at that point, 67, uh, it starts a uh, what the Palestinians call the Naqsa, so a new Palestinian exodus. From around 325,000 people flee from the newly occupied territories. Out of 40% out of those were already refugees from the Nakba of 47, 48. In 1971, the UN report was very clear on what was happening in those territories. And I quote, the government of Israel is deliberately carrying out policies aimed to at preventing the population of the occupied territories from returning to their homes and forcing those who are in their homes in the occupied territories to leave either by direct means such as deportation or indirectly by attempts at undermining their morale or through the offer of special inducements all with the ultimate object of annexing and settling the occupied territories. Moira, I'm finishing. Um, six um, topics, uh, not topics, well, six um, almost slogans to, to end up, uh, to end up, uh, to, to, to finish my, my intervention. Occupation has been systematically associated with securitization of the territory and land confiscation. In this sense, uh, this can evidently be characterized as an apartheid regime, which is which has been already mentioned. There are uh, the, we are living from since 1948 recurrent situations of ethnic cleansing, and they became systemic. And obviously, what we are witnessing in Gaza is exactly um, an ethnic cleansing doubled with a genocide uh, pro project. Thirdly, uh, this is we're talking about colonization and annexation. Fourth, uh, associated with a memoricide, uh, that is thousands of villages, monuments, lieu de mémoire have been raised to the ground, uh, Palestinian ones obviously raised to the ground in the occupied territories uh, of, of Israel, both of the states 19, of 1948, uh, as well as those occupied in 1967. Uh, the Palestinian context is one of systematic and utterly as asymmetrical violence, and in this sense, it has to do with the name of this panel, uh, of this um, session, conflict, this is not a conflict, because it's a term that applies, that term, conflict, applies only to clashes or disputes between states or between equal political and historical actors. This is rather a war of occupation in three stages, uh, which I have tried to, to, to sum up. Finally, it has been a colonial war for the 100 uh, years now, in the era of colonial nationalism that doubled uh, as an era of Western supremacy. Hopefully it is, it should be ending now. Thank you.